So uh, symplectic geometry is the modern outgrowth of, uh, you know, Hamiltonian mechanics in the uh, mechanics in the Hamilton-Jacobi formulation. So let's have a look at some Hamiltonian mechanics. Okay. So um, I want to have a discrete time uh, a sort of dynamical system, which means I have a manifold space of dimension two n that it lives on, which I will assume to be closed, and it comes with a symplectic form, which is a two form, which in local coordinates. Uh, locally, it always looks like this. So P are the you know, momentum and position variables of classical mechanics. And um, you want to have um, a, a diffeomorphism, so an, an invertible differentiable map, which preserves um, the symplectic form. Um, so you can write it like this. So what, what it essentially means, it's, it's a condition on the, on the derivative of phi at any point. Okay? Um, and so the question which sometimes goes, uh, oh, you know, we have a slide problem here. Ah, okay, excellent. Not anymore. Um, there you go. Um, the, the, the question that goes under the name of Conley conjecture um, in my area is, um, is it possible for such a, so the simplest, you know, Poincaré initiated the study of the dynamics of this thing. The simplest aspect of dynamics are the fixed points and the periodic points. Why? Well, because if you restrict to the fixed points, the map does nothing. And if you restrict to the periodic points of order k, the map just becomes a, a discrete ma a map of order k. So, um, so the first question is, is it possible that we could have such a thing which has only finitely many periodic points overall, taking all the periods together? Okay? And I can give you an immediate answer to this question, deep question, which is yes. Um, so if you take the two sphere and you rotate it, the North Pole and the South Pole, um, are uh, fixed points, and if you rotate it by a rational amount, then after a certain time everything will be fixed, but if you rotate it by an irrational amount, there will be no other periodic points. So you're just going to have two. Um, and the same thing is true in, for, for higher dimensions, so complex projective space is in a natural way a symplectic manifold. Um, it carries various rotations, and if you combine them in some kind of generic way, then you will get exactly n plus one fixed points, and there will be no other periodic points ever. Okay, so why is this a question um, of interest at all? Um, well, because you know these these are the, there's this belong to a class of of spaces, but there's other classes of spaces for which the answer is completely different. Okay, so when you study this problem, there's a a slight divergence of taste between the more topological people and the more dynamical systems people, which is the more topological people sort of like to to look at. Um, like to assume that the, the, the periodic points are as simple as possible. So if you have a periodic point, say of order k, you can look at, at the linearization of that point. Um, if that linearization has an eigenvalue 1, is what you know, in the 19th century they would have called an infinite, infinitely close f uh, per other periodic point. So the, the non-degeneracy condition would be to say that this doesn't happen. So this determinant here is non-zero. Um, it's a generic condition. Um, so from one, you know, for the topologists would say, well, you know, that's enough for me because generically it's true. But for the dynamical systems person, which are probably right, they would say, since you are studying an a priori totally unknown dynamical system, how can you start by imposing some conditions on it? So anyway, so the, um, you know, one of the key modern uh, theorems in this subject is, um, you, know, you have to read the theorem backwards, right? So the theorem says there must always be infinitely many periodic points. Um, under what condition here? Well, there's a non-degeneracy condition which was later uh, eliminated uh, with a lot of work by uh, Ginsburg, Gurel, and Hein. Um, and then there are the, the topological conditions. One is that this should be isotopic to the identity, so you can somehow deform it to the identity through maps that are symplectic. Um, and the, the second, there's a condition on first homology, which I, I remember, but the important condition here, which is the condition that, that the sphere or projective space do not satisfy, is every symplectic manifold has a first churn class. And uh, roughly speaking, you know, they, they give you sort of the behavior of this class, this is a cohomology class, gives you a, a rough classification of symplectic manifolds, and you assume that this is zero. Okay, sometimes called the Calabi Yao condition. And in that case, there must always be. So there's, for a very large class, we have that there always have to be infinitely many periodic points. Um, and then uh, Ginsburg and Gurel uh, showed that um, if the first churn class, see this form here, the symplectic form is itself closed. It is a, 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 a cohomology class. So another possibility would be the first churn class is minus that class or plus that class. If it's plus that class, you are in the, in the, in the bad cases here, which we don't understand. 
But if it's minus, again, you have to have infinitely many periodic points. So, you know, even though it seems an elementary question about dynamics, um, the verdict is that uh, the global topology of the manifold plays an important role in a way which we frankly do not understand, okay? Um, and uh, so, actually for, for S2, I mean, this is a sort of low dimensional case, the dynamics of area preserving homeomorphisms of surfaces is a big area in itself. And one of the celebrated theorems is that either you have two um, periodic points, just like here on the irrational rotation, or you have infinitely many, okay? And, you know, big efforts are underway to understand what this means for us in higher dimensions, okay? So this is a sort of picture of what we do in, in symplectic geometry. Um, now you might say, well, I announced that this would be Hamiltonian dynamical systems, but you don't see any Hamiltonian dynamical systems for two reasons. One, because my systems are in discrete time, right? And in real life, time is not discrete. And two, because I asked for my manifolds to be compact, to be closed, which in terms of a, a, of a mechanical system, that would mean that the, the total achievable energy, uh, kinetic plus potential, is bounded. Okay? That seems like an extremely unrealistic assumption. So usually I would just say, well, so what? But in, in front of a larger audience, I feel that I should motivate. Uh, why? It's not, uh, you know, how we came about studying this particular situation. So let's start with an actual you know, genuine continuous time Hamiltonian dynamical system. So we have a manifold M, which now no longer has to be closed. Uh, a symplectic manifold, we have a function. So to any function, so that's, that's the, the Hamiltonian, to any function we can associate a vector field, the Hamiltonian vector field X, and we study its flow, which is now a flow in continuous time. Okay? Um, and so again, the simplest elements of its dynamics, well, would be the fixed points of the flow, but those correspond to uh, the critical points of the function, so we understand them reasonably well. Um, the next simplest thing would be if you have a periodic flow line. So you start at some point x0, which I'm assuming is not a fixed point, so you start moving, and then after some time t0, you come back to x0. Okay, that's the simplest dynamical feature. Uh, and so Poincaré uh, you know, proposed studying the, the dynamics near such periodic points, um, by doing the following trick. So, so first of all, the uh, dynamical system, um, so the flow here preserves H, so H is an invariant of motion. So supposing that we s our periodic point X0 lies on some level set, H equals H0, we can just restrict the flow to that level set here. Um, so we, we, we lose one dimension, which simplifies our things a little bit. And then we do the following thing. So at the point X0, we take a small transfer slice to the orbit, so that's dimension one even less. So if this is, you know, this is a, a local chart around x0, it's of dimension, if m had dimension 2n, the level set had dimension 2n minus 1, so this is a 2n minus 1 thing, and I take a small 2n minus 2 linear subspace, let's say, which is transverse, and then if I start, so if I start x0 lies in it, and x0 goes back to itself, so then if I start from a point that's sufficiently close to x0, at some point, sorry, I start here, at, I will go out and at some point the flow will bring me back to a neighborhood and will get you another point of this transfer slice. So this transfer slice here comes with a discrete time dynamical system called the Poincaré return map. Okay? And this is how discrete time dynamical systems arise. Now you will say, well, that does not really motivate the study of periodic points as such because the dynamical system, this Poincaré return map is defined on a small neighborhood uh, it's a sort of a local thing, and the domain of definition gets smaller and smaller as you try to pass to iterates. So studying periodic points seems a bit perverse, but there are cases where you can actually do it for any iteration, um, and in fact it leads you to a discrete time dynamical system that's defined on a closed symplectic manifold. Okay? And one such case is when you have additional symmetry. So suppose that your manifold has a rotational symmetry, an um, action of the circle, um, which is, uh, you know, um, a sort of Hamiltonian symmetry, so by Noether's theorem it comes with, a, with an invariant function, um, the, the, the momentum function, mu, and suppose that um, H and mu Poisson commute. So that, that means that the rotation and the flow also commute, okay? And suppose that your original uh, periodic point actually lies inside the fixed point set of your circle action. So then you can choose your transfer slice to be invariant under the circle action, so you get a circle action on this slice here. 
So the slice itself is like a little piece of a flat space of dimension 2 n minus 2. Now it has a circle action. Let's suppose that the circle action is just normal rotation in all coordinates. Okay. So then first of all, what happens, and in fact, the, the circle action will be normal rotation, and then the, the momentum map will be a constant plus the standard quadratic function. So now you restrict to a constant level set of the momentum map, which is a sphere inside your 2n minus 2 set, and then you divide by the circle to go on to a quotient space. So that gives you, you reduce by another two dimensions now, what, and you get an induced map here, um, which is a sort of a, a reduced version of the Poincaré return map. Now the fixed points of this map here no longer correspond to you know, the actual original flow coming back to itself. It corresponds to the original flow coming back to itself up to some kind of rotation, which is part of this S1 action. Okay? And in, you know, if, if, you do, if things work out, as I said, actually this map here, this reduced Poincaré return map, will actually live on a complex projective space. Okay? It depends on an additional parameter, which is which value of the, of the uh, conserved quantity of this mu you take. If you take mu to be very, very close to the value that mu takes at x0, then this map psi bar is almost a linear map of projective space. So it's kind of easy to understand in a kind of perturbational way. Um, but as you go away from it, the only thing that you know is that it's isotopic to a linear map. Uh, can be deformed to a linear map, therefore can be deformed to the identity. So the question about the dynamics of this is exactly the question that we had before, right here, for complex projective space. It just is, happens to be that complex projective space is one of the cases where we can't actually answer much about the dynamics. Okay? But so there is genuine, you know, this is something that you can get to um, from reasonably standard questions in, in actual mechanics. Okay? Right. Questions. So, um, what's going to happen from now on? So, so, so the first aspect of symplectic geometry is that you know it arises from from Hamiltonian dynamics, and and this is very good because the questions that Hamiltonian dynamics brings to us are very deep and hard questions. Okay. And the second aspect is that you know over the last um, I don't know what at least twenty five years, the subject has shown a voracious appetite for absorbing ideas from all sorts of overmath. Okay, so as a result, you know, you you, you sometimes get a, a you know a puzzling combination of ingredients that go into thinking about this. So instead of sort of going straight down this 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 area and, and showing you what other theorems we have, I'm going to focus on a tiny tiny piece of this, which is the study of periodic points of order two. Okay, um, and um, and I'm going to sort of give a slice across this, which shows you where all the ideas come from that we can sort of bring to bear on this. Okay? The disadvantage of that process is that um, you know, there will be no really major theorems proved. But the advantage is that we go at fast speed through a whole bunch of different areas, so if there's something up on the slide that you don't understand at all, it will be replaced two slides later by something completely different. Okay? So here's you go, what you do completely different. As I said, um, you know, the, the, when you study two periodic points, you know, you restrict your, your map to two periodic points, it becomes an involution. So we have to talk about involution. So let's talk about involutions. Okay? So the simplest kind of involution I can think of is an involution on a vector space. So you take a vector space um, together with an action of Zemo2, which simply means an involution. Okay? So how exciting is this as a subject? Well, it depends on its vector space over a field, and it depends on the characteristic of the field. So if the characteristic is not 2, so you can divide by half, the theory is relatively boring. So the, the educated way to say that the theory is boring is that you consider this vector space with Z2 actions and they form a semi-simple abelian category. But what it really means is the following thing. You have your vector space, you have um, your, um, your involution yota, and it has eigenspaces, plus one eigenspace and minus one eigenspace, and these are the projectors that project to the plus and minus part, okay, which are entirely canonical. So in fact, studying these things with this Z2 action is the same thing as studying the theory of pairs of vector spaces, the plus eigenspace and the minus eigenspace. So this is not an exciting theory. Okay? So what happens if the characteristic is equal to 2? Well, it's just sufficiently non-trivial to be kind of interesting. Yeah? So you have an involution on your vector space. Independently of what the characteristic is or something, you can always take the fixed part so the vectors that are, that are fixed by the involution, that form, they form a linear subspace. Now, over here what we had is 
you know, we had this, uh, the identity plus or minus yota, which is the involution divided by two. Now we can no longer divide by two over a field of characteristic two, but we can still take uh, v minus yota or v plus yota, which are in fact the same thing, okay? But uh, now what happens is that, you know, no matter what you start with, this thing here is always an invariant vector, okay? Um, because, well, you apply yota, it seems to change sign, but of course minus one is plus one, so nothing happens to it, okay? So this means, so we have this space here, which is a subspace, that's, uh, that's invariant under the action because the action does nothing on it. If you pass to the quotient, the induced action on the quotient is also trivial because mod v yota v is equal to yota of v. Okay, so the quotient also carries the trivial induced action. That sounds like strange. So isn't the whole action trivial because you know, it's equal on the subspace and it's equal on the quotient? So the situation is this, that we have this thing here, the subspace where, it's tr where the action is trivial. We have this quotient here and then if you look at this, sta this statement here, what it says is that v minus yota of v always lies in the subspace. And of course, it will be zero if you start with v already in that subspace. So it gives you an injective map here. Okay? So, so there's a vector space, a subspace, a quotient space. If I allow myself to, to write this v as a direct sum of these two parts here, which is I can, but not canonically, then the action will look like this. Right? So this is a matrix that, since we're in characteristic two, it actually squares to the identity, so it's an involution. So, so roughly speaking, this means that the theory of Z2 actions on vector spaces of characteristic two um, is like the theory of pairs of vector spaces, namely this space here and the other space, together with an injective map from one to the other. It's not exactly true because I used the splitting, which wasn't co totally canonical. Okay? So, so this is not quite a trivial theory, so there is a way to attach you know, invariants more canonically to this thing here. Um, and it's typically called sort of group cohomology. Okay, so from now on, I'm going to focus always on the case which is non-trivial, where, where a field of characteristic two, if you, you know, the field with two elements will do fine. Okay, um, F two. So, so you take V, which has um, has this involution, and you take infinitely many copies of V, which you label, take the product, which you label by inc increasing powers of some formal variable U which is thought to have degree one. And so you have a copy in the, of V in degree zero, in degree one, degree two, and so on. And then you write a differential which increases the degree by one, which is U times the identity minus the involution. And um, you know, this thing here squares to zero. Um, so it gives rise to a chain complex. So it takes this, this is the group co-chain complex. And its cohomology, which is kernel mod co-kernel, is called the group cohomology of V, okay? So, you know, if I use the splittings from the previous slide, what, what's happening here is actually that the identity minus yota is what I used to call sigma. So this co-chain complex is I have these two vector spaces in degree zero, same thing in degree one, and then I have this injective map here. Okay, so the cohomology is, well, this guy here entirely lies in the kernel, the differential is zero, so I get a copy of this invariant part. In degree one, since, this, since sigma is injective, the kernel is again this, but I have to divide by that. So it's V yota divided by the stuff that comes from here. And the same thing in all other degrees. So this is what the group cohomology looks like if I write it out in, in previous terms. It's slightly bigger in degree zero and then in each other degree it sort of reproduces the same thing. Uh, you will notice that, you know, this is again, you know, this is sort of a, a module over the ring of power series in U. So you can multiply by U and the multiplication by U is just a projection here. It can, it can have kernel. If you don't like the fact that multiplying by u, you know, if you don't like working over power series in u, which is some kind of ring, um, you can invert u, so you can allow negative, finitely many negative powers of u, which is a field, uh, and there's a corresponding version where you allow finitely many powers of u, which gives rise to a version of group cohomology, which is called Tate cohomology. And now this one here has the advantage that, um, you know, this, this strange piece here disappears. It's the same in all degrees. That's called Tate cohomology. Okay, so for instance, you know, if you, if you have the trivial, if the action is trivial, so yota is the identity, the differential vanishes, and the group cohomology is the same as the group complex, and the Tate cohomology is, is also the same. So except it has these strange copies with labelings of U. Um, the opposite case to a trivial action, in a sense, um, so the trivial action has sigma equals zero. The opposite case is where you have a vector space which has a basis which is freely exchanged by the involution. Okay? So in that case, 
This piece here, sigma section isomorphism, the co-kernel is zero. So the group cohomology just ends up with, uh, with uh, a piece here. And then if you take, if you pass by the, if you pass to the um, Tate version, then the Tate cohomology is zero. Okay? So this is the way that we usually encode this information. Um, now, let me, now that we have this group cohomology, we have a fancy group cohomology, let's use it to define an invariant of just vector spaces with no action. Okay? So I start with a vector space. I take this tensor itself, and I take the Z2 action, which changes the two factors. Okay? So no other information enters this except V. And then I take its group cohomology. Okay? And so the group cohomology has this thing in degree zero, which is the second symmetric product. And then in higher degrees, you just sort of get a copy of V itself. In fact, if you take um, the Tate version, it just essentially gives you back V. Okay? This is a little weird fact because, you know, we started from V and we went to V tensor V, which is some kind of, you know, operation which is not additive. Um, and, then, um, and then we sort of recover V itself. So in fact, there's, you know, there's not just, um, you know, it's not, not just that they happen to be isomorphic, but there, there is actually a preferred isomorphism. So there's a map from here. If you take V goes to V tensor V, um, well, that's not, the, this looks bad because it's not even an additive map. So V plus W doesn't go to V tensor V plus W tensor W. But it, you, if you look carefully, it actually does induce um, a map between this and the cohomology here which is again not additive, but which becomes additive if you multiply by u. So anyway, this map here, it's called the Tate map, actually induces this isomorphism here. Okay. You'll probably ask yourself, how long can I possibly talk about Z2 actions on vector spaces? And the answer is, I can talk about it for a whole another slide. <laughs> okay. So, um, so instead of a vector space, I want to assume that we have you know, a chain complex itself. So, uh, you know, it's a vector space in each degree. In itself, they have a differential, which raises degree, with an involution, which commutes with a differential. Okay? And this, again, it has, it has a group cohomology with coefficients in V and its Tate version. What you do is you take the same complex as before, uh, sticking V in, with the same differential as before, um, but now you add uh, the, the original differential of the chain complex to it. Okay? And this, so this gives rise, again, this group cohomology with coefficients in V and its Tate version. Okay? So, and uh, as usual, you can say, well, that's right. Let me use this to make an invariant of chain complexes. I take it just any chain complex with no action. I take the chain complex tensor itself. And then I take the equivariant cohomology, let's say in the Tate version of V tensor V, the action exchanges the two factors. This is an invariant of V. In fact, it's an invariant of V that you know very well, which is the cohomology of V itself. Okay? This thing here is induced by the, by the Tate map. There's, this looks stupid, but it's much less stupid than it looks, because the Tate map is not additive. So it's a bit of a miracle that actually induces a, a, a nice linear map on cohomology groups. Also, the degrees gets totally messed up in here. Now, V itself is a chain compass, has a degree. Remember, the Tate map maps V to V tensor V. Okay? So this comes out, the gradient gets lost, but you recover the original V. Okay, so um, I'm still not done with this guy here. You will notice that this guy here has a differential, which consists of two pieces. Um, so the, the equivariant piece and, and the, um, the original differential in the chain complex. There's a standard method for studying this thing via spectral sequences, which basically means that you declare one part of the differential to be the primary part and consider the other part as a small perturbation. Okay? And you can do it with, you know, um, you can do it, play this in, in, very di in various different ways. Um, you can say, how can this be? How can I decide which is the small perturbation? Well, if you don't choose the small perturbation right, there's, things will fail to converge, which means that you know, you're not getting anything useful. Okay? But so in this case here, the obvious thing is to declare this guy here, which comes with the power of u, to be your small perturbation. And so what happens is that you first consider only this as a differential, which gets you the cohomology of the original complex. Then you add this as a new differential. You get a series of approximations which gets smaller and smaller which is called the spectral sequence, um, and, um, and which eventually will, will sort of lead you to the equivalent cohomology, which you wanted to. There's also another way that you can do is, um, which is to declare, um, 
declare this guy here to be small and this here to be the primary. So in that case here, um, you start by, uh, by sort of looking at, at V itself just as a graded vector space and ignoring the fact it had a differential. And you take its group cohomology and then you go on from there. And one simple example is this thing here, is if you have a bounded complex and each of its vector spaces has a basis that's freely acted on by the involution, then the Tate cohomology of the whole thing will vanish because the Tate cohomology of each piece will vanish and therefore the spectral sequence already starts with zero and just gets smaller from there, which means nothing happens. Um, so this is irrespective of what the differential is. So really we've, we've declared dv to be irrelevant um, and got some information. So, okay. So this is the, um, you know, this is the version. We had this one here, um, the example, uh, sorry. Um, uh, anyway, I, okay, so, okay, so now, so, so far we, we got a, a, a nice linear algebra lecture. Um, now I'm going to cut again and go to algebraic topology where these things actually get used. So, suppose we have a, a space, I mean, I don't, it does, wouldn't have to be a manifold, but I like manifolds. A manifold with a smooth involution, okay? So it has an involution, it has its fixed point set, it's a sub-manifold. So in this situation here, um, you define something which is called equivariant cohomology. So how does equivariant cohomology go? Well, take co-chains, whichever you usually use to compute cohomology, but with, with coefficient in, in, in this field of characteristic two. Um, so let's say singular co-chains or um, singular co-chains are nice. So then rho induces an involution on the space of singular co-chains by pulling back. Uh, so this becomes a chain complex with a, with a Z2 action and you apply the algebraic machinery to this. And this defines equivariant cohomology. And similarly, there's a Tate version of equivariant cohomology. Now these spectral sequences that, that I did before, uh, which seemed rather arbitrary, now suddenly become useful. The first spectral sequence with the UIDIC filtration starts with the ordinary cohomology with the additional parameter. Then there's be a differential on this, which is the difference between the identity and rho acting on cohomology. So this gives you a differential on this twin here. It gets smaller and then you continue and eventually you get to equivariant cohomology. And so this gives you a bound on how big equivariant cohomology is. Roughly speaking, it's not any bigger than the ordinary cohomology, okay? Or if you want to be slightly more precise, you can say, well, let me take the Tate version, which is, uh, you know, it's a self-graded vector space over this field here of Laurent series. Its dimension is less than the dimension of the ordinary cohomology. In fact, it's less than the dimension of the fixed part of the ordinary cohomology. Or, you know, you can do the, the, the other approach which privileges, um, you know, which, which, which privileges the, the, not the differential on cohomology, but the actual action on chains. And using this, for instance, you prove that if the action is fixed point free, then the Tate version is actually zero. Okay? Okay, so now, you know, my, my hobby is to apply this equivalent machinery to cases which have no symmetry. So let's suppose we take any given m, take the product of m cross itself, and we have the involution which exchanges the two um, factors, okay? So the cohomology of m cross m is the cohomology of m tensor the cohomology of m. Um, that's the Kuhn theorem. How about if you do it equivariantly, right? So, well, the natural thing is, you know, let me say it like this. If the result of this exercise was exciting, the equivalent cohomology of m cross m, we would have gotten a new invariant of m, right? Which seems kind of unplausible, and in fact it isn't. So if you consider the ch equivalent chain complex with action on m cross m, it's up to homotopy, it's the, it's the equivalent chain complex of two product, tensor products of this with the z2 action, which acts as the involution. So this is chain homotopy equivalent to its own cohomology. So what you really have is just the cohomology, group cohomology of the, the involution action on two copies of the cohomology of M. In particular, if you get the Tate version and you use what I said before, it turns out that, you know, you take M plus M with the involution exchanging the two factors, you take equivalent cohomology and you just recover the cohomology of M. Okay? So that seems a very roundabout way of recovering the cohomology of M. But in fact, I lied to you, you can actually get new invariants of M in this way which are the steel rod squares, okay? So here's what it goes like. So let's consider the diagonal on M cross M, right? So the diagonal, you know, I have the involution on M cross M which exchanges the two factors. The diagonal um, is, is the, exactly the fixed point set. So if I consider the equivalent cohomology of just the diagonal, the action is trivial. 
So I just get the cohomology of the diagonal, which is the cohomology of M, with this additional sort of useless parameter. Okay? Okay, so now I have two maps. I have the previous map, which was uh, you know, an isomorphism. Uh, so I have the Tate map, which goes from the cohomology of M to the cohomology, equivalent cohomology of M cross M. And you have the restriction to the diagonal, just in cohomology, um, which goes from M cross M to M being the diagonal. Okay? And so if you combine the two, you get a map here, which goes from the cohomology of M to the cohomology of M, except this has this U powers. And what is this map? Well, you might think, well, what is this map? It's going to be the identity. But that's actually not true. In fact, it's, if you think about it for degree reasons, that can't quite be the truth. And what it is, it's an, it's a, it's an operation, the total Steenrod operation. Okay? So which means you look at this guy here. So it's a map from cohomology to cohomology. And it maps x to x squared. And then comes a bunch of lower correction terms. Okay? And um, actually, the last term, so they come with high-end power, powers of u. And the last term, which comes with the highest power of u, it gives you back x itself. So it, you'll notice that because this term here is just the identity, if you allow yourself to invert u, you actually get an automorphism of, com of, the, of the cohomology. OK, so um, you know the Steenrod squares were the sign somehow that um, serious hard things were going on in cohomology theory. And uh, you know, in a sense, they, they, they encapsulate much of the difficulty in algebraic topology. Okay. So, so why am I talking about Steenrod squares? Yeah, let me talk about something completely different. Okay, so um, now I have to explain to you. You know, if you look at Poincaré studying, you know, Hamiltonian dynamical systems, he was interested in fixed points, periodic points. He was also interested in many other aspects, but the fixed points and the periodic points we have been particularly successful in studying. Okay, and why is that? Because there is a variational interpretation of the looking of looking for a fixed point. Okay, and so now I'm going to explain what this looks like, the variational interpretation, what it leads to. Okay, so first what it leads to. So the setup is this. Take a compact symplectic manifold and take an automorphism. And for reasons of practicality um, and also you know, because it makes my life a lot easier, I will assume that the symplectic form is D of some one form, which is true in some cases but not others, and a similar condition for, for the automorphism. But you can ignore this. So anyway, there is an invariant associated to this in algebraic invariant, a kind of cohomology group. So it's, it's a, like a cohomology group, it's a, it's a vector space, but it's only graded mod 2. So there's this degree 0 part, degree 1 part, and if you like, they repeat. Or, you know, the, the grading is mod 2. It's called fixed point flow cohomology. It's a graded vector space. It's an invariant. It's the simplest thing you could think about is what is its Euler characteristic. So its Euler characteristic is dimension of the 0 minus dimension of the 1 part. That's the Lefschetz number of phi. So it's a traditional invariant of phi. The, the other features that you want to know is that assume if the fixed points of phi are non-degenerate, then the dimension of this group gives you a lower bound for the number of fixed points. Okay? And that lower bound is usually a lot better than what you get from just considering the left shift number. And the third one is that within the class of phi that, that I'm allowed to have, um, this thing here is invariant under isotopies. So basically, you compute it, you get a lower bound for the number of fixed points, but you also get a lower bound that persists under isotopies. Okay? So, so an ex the simplest example is if you take, you know, take a function on your manifold. Now, because I assume that omega is exact, my manifold necessarily needs to have a boundary, which is a bit of a pity. But you take a function in suitable class, you flow a little bit of time in Hamiltonian flow, then the flow cohomology is just the ordinary cohomology. That's not very typical. So the, the case where you actually flow a lot, simplest case is where you have your manifold is an annulus. And you take a map which on the left side of the annulus rotates by some angle alpha. And then as you go in annulus, it rotates more and more and more until, let's say, at the other end, you rotate it by alpha plus 2 pi k. Okay? And then, then the flow cohomology has 2 k copies of the cohomology of the circle. So the lower bound that you get on the number of fixed points is 2 k. OK, so this is the formal structure of this thing. And this is our main tool in studying fixed points. Okay? So why does this exist? Well, here comes with the variational interpretation. Okay, so the variational interpretation is that the fixed points of your map phi are critical points of a certain functional. So the functional lives on a version of the free loop space. So it's a space of, say, maps from R to M, which you know they're not quite periodic from T to T plus one, but they're periodic up to applying this automorphism phi. 
so it's twisted. So you can imagine it as a string that goes from 0 to 1, and the, the 0 endpoint is the image of the 1 endpoint under phi. And so this thing here carries a version of the Hamilton-Jacobi action functional. Now that, that's why I had to assume that omega was exact, so I can write down this thing without ambiguities. And the critical points of this functional are the constant x, but since I, uh, I used I impose this periodicity condition, if x is constant, it is necessarily a fixed point. Okay? And so if your fixed points are non-degenerate, you can sort of make a, a, you know, a sort of a version of homology which, which counts them. So you make a chain complex whose generators are the fixed points and whose differential is given by something. Now, what is the something? I've written down more than I want to explain. But the differential is given by, by counting certain, is, is given by considering certain cylinders. One thing to remember is that the differential is not local. The second thing to remember is that the differential depends on lots of additional choices, uh, which have to be done in some way, you know, to satisfy certain genericity requirements. And the final thing is that it is a sort of variational theory for, for this action functional. So you have this thing here which is generated by fixed points. Every fixed point has a certain value of its action. And the differential will increase the action. So it sends x to a linear combination of things which have higher action. So this is, our, this is roughly our definition. Um, so this is for fixed points. So what do I do if I actually want to study periodic points? Let's say periodic points of index 2. So, so if you assume that you're, you're not doing phi, but you're doing phi squared, then so you know, if you have the ordinary free loop space, you can rotate loops by any amount. Right. Um, in our case, we have the twisted loop space. You know, you can't quite do it because of the periodicity condition. But if phi is a square, if you have phi square, you can sort of rotate loops by half and then apply phi to them, and that gives you an involution. If you do it twice, it's the identity. So it's an involution on this free loop space. It preserves the action functional, and well, in an, so and it induces an involution on this on this space that I've defined because this space is generated by fixed points. The fixed points of phi squared are just the two periodic points of phi. There's an obvious involution of that, which is phi acting. Okay? So in an ideal world, um, I could now apply the machinery of, you know, this would carry an would be a chain complex with involution that I can apply the previous machinery to. Um, this is not an ideal world because of these, the other things that enter into the definition. You can't make this, uh, this involution once, it will act on this thing here but it won't, um, it won't be compatible with the, the differential that I've defined. So you have to modify it by higher order correction terms. The only thing you want to know about these higher order correction terms is really that they increase the action. So there's an uh, unfortunate infinite order of higher order correction terms, but you can still define um, equivariant cohomology. In fact, the good thing about, you know, when I defined equivariant cohomology, the differential had the form something plus u times something else. There seemed to be a lot of space for putting in u squared and u cubed terms. And this is the moment where you actually need them. Okay? So it's something that there's a weaker notion than an action on a, on a chain complex, what I would call a homotopy action. And this is what you get. And this is exactly the framework in which equivariant cohomology anyway wants to live. Okay, so, so we have this object here. It somehow it counts the, per the two periodic points of phi, which are the fixed point of phi squared. It takes into account the action. Um, let me see. Um, um, I'm going to skip this slide. And so so now, now I pass to something else, um, which is the following thing. So, so this flow cohomology was invented in the mid-1980s, okay? Um, and at that time, it is some kind of, it behaves, in some sense, it is like ordinary cohomology, but in other senses, it is completely unlike it, like having a ZMOD2 grading. So um, people ask themselves, you know, what, what, is it? what is it? Is it it's a cohomology, but what's it actually cohomology of? Is there an actual space that it's the cohomology of? And in particular, you know, do I have things like Steenrod operations on it? That would sort of make it a space, at least to my level of accuracy. And in fact, if you look at the literature, there were two totally different approaches um, introduced to how, what you should mean by a Steenrod square. So the first approach is really to construct a space, or let's say a spectrum, 
as well, done by Cohen, Jones, and Siegel, um, underlying so some space whose cohomology would be the Fleur cohomology. Okay? And the first surprise was that this doesn't actually always work. Okay? You have to impose additional topological conditions, which are pretty strict. Okay? So your condition is there's a condition on the, on the tangent bundle of your symplectic manifold, which is a pretty stiff condition. It's essentially trivial after maybe increasing its dimension. And so if you think of the tangent bundle as being trivial and you have the automorphism phi, then the differential of phi is a map from M into the linear symplectic group. And you also have to add the condition that this map be essentially you know, topologically trivial. Um, this is not maybe, no, the, the conditions are slightly more general than those, but um, this is the simplest thing I can write down. So if this is true, you can define a kind of space in there uh, whose cohomology is the Fleur cohomology, and uh, in particular you get Steenrod squares, Steenrod operations acting on this. The advantage is that obviously the whole th basic theory of Steenrod operations takes over because they, you know, it's essentially, it's, it's an example of the classical theory of Steenrod operations, so they satisfy all the axioms and relation, quite complicated relations that you're used to. And the drawback is that the construction of the space depends on the choice of trivialization and on a choice of null homotopy, so it's by no means canonical. So you represent your Fleur cohomology group as a cohomology of the space, but there are many different choices for what that space could be, and the, the Steenrod operations will be all different. So the other version was advocated by Fukaya, and, and then you know there's a, a series of papers, Bohr, Betzko, and Norbury, doing it at least in the sort of toy model cases, um, which is to say, we should copy the definition of Steenrod squares that I started originally, right? This guy here, um, in which, uh, so, oopsie, so, um, so I should have some kind of product operation where I start with the Fleur cohomology of phi, two copies, some kind of product square. I land, necessarily have to land in phi square. Now, um, this guy here is equivalent with respect to the exchange of the two copies of here. So there's this Tate map. So the upshot is that you do get um, a map, but you know you do get. So this would be this diagonal thing would be the, your replacement of the total Steenrod map, um, but it doesn't. It's not actually an operation on this group here. It goes from the Fleur cohomology of phi to the equivariant Fleur cohomology of phi squared. So if phi is the identity. There's no difference between phi and phi squared. And you can actually compare these things, the, the two proposals directly, and they are both supposed to be uh, the ordinary Steenrod squares in, in, in cohomology, essentially. But for general phi, um, it seems bizarre that um, you know, the, the two versions actually land completely. This one here has the advantage that um, you know, um, once you construct it, that there's no conditions like this homotopy condition here. So it's general, and there's also no additional choices. Now, the drawback is that you know, this is an entirely new construction. There's, there's no saying that it will satisfy what the analogs would be of the classical properties of the Steenrod squares. In fact, I doubt very much that there are actually literal analogs. Okay? Um, so this is a funny situation um, in which, now you see that when you look at this approach here, you understand the relevance to the problem of, um, of studying um, periodic points of order two, because it connects phi and phi squared in a natural way. Okay. Now, um, it turns out that last week, um, a preprint was posted by Kristen Hendricks, which contains the exact ingredient that you need to connect these two constructions. Okay. And so, what is her ingredient? So she defined a map um, from the Fleur cohomology of phi squared to the Fleur cohomology of phi, a sort of localization map. Um, so it goes from here to there. Um, now remember this, this kind of, if we make a homotopy type underlying this, so space, it will come with Steenrod squares, which are operations from cohomology to cohomology. Um, on the other hand, we have this other proposal by Fukaya, which goes from phi to phi squared. So they, they land in different things. But the Kristen Hendricks's map exactly goes from here to there. So it forms a nice diagram. And so, you know, um, it, it was 
known before that if you want to have these kind of localization maps, you need to impose some additional conditions. And when you spell out those conditions for entirely unrelated, apparently entirely unrelated reasons, they turn out to be exactly the conditions that you need to define the, the Fleur homotopy type, the sort of John, John Siegel condition. And again, this map here will actually depend on choices. Okay? So, so you have a nice diagram here. And uh, the, the conjecture is that this diagram commutes. So in that sense, the two approaches to defining uh, Steenrod operations in this strange cohomology theory um, would actually be the same. Um, this, has a b this would have a bunch of consequences. I think this is a good conjecture because both things are defined in rather different ways. The, the same condition arises in rather different ways. OK, but that's maybe you can say, well, you're having fun defining all these things, but you know, there is um, no indication that they're actually of any use. Okay? So I, I need to um, go back to topology for a moment. There's something important that I didn't tell you, okay? which is the so-called localization theorem. So if you have a manifold, you have a Z2 action, we, we consider the, the, um, the inclusion of the fixed point set. So there is restriction in equivariant cohomology, which goes um, from the equivalent cohomology of M to the equivalent cohomology of the fixed point set, which again is just the ordinary cohomology of the fixed point set. And the theorem, localization theorem, says that if you pass to the Tate version, so you allow inverses of U, this becomes an isomorphism. Okay? Now, what I said before is that the ordinary cohomology, um, you know, the, the one thing we can tell is that the equivalent cohomology is not really bigger than ordinary cohomology. Okay. On the other hand, this map says that the cohomology of the fixed point set is not really bigger than equivariant cohomology. So it follows that the cohomology of the fixed point set, now no equivariance, is not really bigger than the cohomology um, of the entire manifold. In fact, the, the invariant part of the cohomology of the previous manifold. Okay. So um, this is an inequality of total dimensions. Um, it's very hard to explain unless you believe in equivariant cohomology because in the middle of the equivariant cohomology, all degrees get messed up by this artificial variable u. So this does not hold degree by degree. Absolutely not. So this is famous Smith inequality. Um, so for instance, you know, if you take uh, the three sphere and you take which sort of as R3 and a point at infinity and you take the involution which rotates it like this, you will have a fixed circle, which is this line here plus the point at infinity. And it's impossible, so in that case it's an equality, and it's impossible to have an involution on S3, no matter how nonlinear, whose fixed point set is two circles. Okay? Um, and the, the, I mean, a famous application is uh, when you have a space with an involution, when you have a, an algebraic variety, which is defined by equations with real coefficients. So you can consider the complex points, it's a complex algebraic variety, but then real involution will act on this. Um, and so, for instance, you know, you can ask yourself if you have a smooth real algebraic curve of degree d, you know, th that's an algebraic curve in RP2, so it consists of a bunch of circles. How many circles are there? And it's bounded by the topology of the complex part, which you know because it only depends on the degree, and so you get a sort of uh, a bound on how many circles you can have. So this is actually useful. Okay? It's, it's not... Um, so how, how do you prove such a thing that's an isomorphism? Well, there's, there's essentially two approaches. Um, one is to say, well, let me look at the, what is the restriction map on chains. And suppose that I, I pick a like, nice triangulation of my space. So some, it's, it's divided into simplices. Some simplices are entirely contained in the fixed part. And so the restriction map just takes that simplex to that simplex. And otherwise, I have pairs of simplices which are freely exchanged by the involution. Okay? So then when you restrict, this is going to be onto. And the kernel consists of these things which are freely exchanged. And then when you apply Tate to that, there's a theorem, which I actually discussed, which says that the Tate cohomology of this guy will die. Okay? So this is the first proof. So it's just based on the algebraic properties. There's a second, more geometric proof. You know, this proof is a bit unsatisfying because you have the restriction map. You proved it's an isomorphism in Tate cohomology, but you didn't actually construct the inverse geometrically. You can, do, you can also do a... Um, a second proof, which is based on actually constructing the inverse, um, which is, you know, there's, a, there's in cohomology, there's restriction, but since we're on a manifold, there's also push forward, which increases degrees. So there's an equivalent version of push forward. If you take push forward and then restriction, that's not, so that's a map from the cohomology of the fixed point set to itself. It's not exactly the identity, it's multiplication by a certain class, the Euler class. But in this case here, the Euler class is actually invertible. So you push forward and pull back, and that's an isomorphism. 
And then the other direction is a little bit harder, and it's actually a bit hard to make that proof entirely independent of the previous proof. But so there's a proof that involves going essentially going back and forth. OK. And so for flow cohomology, which is rather more mysterious, we actually have a localization theorem, which is uh, in Hendrick's paper, which depends on, this, on these conditions, these topological conditions, uh, which require you to, to define the localization map. But it again says, this localization map, if you do the Tate version, you divide U, um, you invert U, it becomes an isomorphism. And the consequence of this is that the flow cohomology, so it's the same thing, the Smith inequality uh, that we had before, the flow cohomology of phi squared is greater or equal than the flow cohomology of phi. Now you will say, well, this is obvious because if you think of how this is defined, it's defined by starting with the fixed points of phi. This is start by defining it with the fixed points of phi squared. Clearly, every fixed point of phi is a fixed point of phi squared. So there's more on the left. Okay? But remember that flow cohomology is isotopy. Well, first of all, that, that wouldn't work at all because there could be cancellation, right? But secondly, remember that flow cohomology is invariant under isotopies. So you can deform phi squared in any way, not through squares, but through any kind of assembly. Uh, and, and it will still need to have the number of fixed points that are given by this lower bound. Okay? And, um, you know, in fact, when you look at the simplest example, which is area preserving surface diffeomorphisms, where we know a lot about this, and you go through it, you really see that, you know, you have these lower bounds, and they, in, you know, if you pass to the square, they never really get less. But it is sort of case by case. Uh, uh, versions. So, so this, is, this is actually uh, you know, a, an important thing, and it's, it's an important handle on two periodic points. In particular, you know, remember, if you take phi, which is close to the identity, the flow cohomology is actually um, you know, the cohomology of m. Um, if you have the flow cohomology, which is not the cohomology of m, say so it's larger, then phi can't be isotopic to the identity. But also then phi squared can't be isotopic to the identity. So it has all sorts of consequences. Um, also, the, the, you know, this map here becomes an isomorphism after tensoring, but you know, the existence of this map has all sorts of, uh, it gives rise to additional issues that you want to look at. Okay, so now the only theorem that's new that I'm going to state in this talk is that you don't actually need this homotopical triviality condition. So, so Hendrix's thing is, is, is modeled on the, on the sort of classical localization map, which goes from the cohomology to the cohomology of the fixed point set. But I want to model this on this product that there was one of the definitions of ST in root square. So this equivalent product here turns out to be an isomorphism after you invert U. So, so that gives you a map in the, the, so basically, excuse me, I have to go back to this diagram and then you'll understand what I'm talking about. Um, so, Hendrix's result is that this guy here is an isomorphism. Um, and my result is that the vertical guy is an isomorphism. Um, so, uh, but, but the vertical guy is defined without any of those conditions here. Okay? So, you know, now I feel that so far I haven't really given you a good feeling for. Um, you know, what arguments look like. In particular, I, remember I, I introduced all sorts of additional structures on flow cohomology, but I didn't uh, say that. So, so there, there are, um, sorry, I'm on the wrong slide. Okay, that will teach me. There you go. So, so this theorem here, how's it actually proved? Okay, and so I can give you, you know, the proofs in, in flow cohomology, well, the proof that I actually did uses you know, the action filtration. It basically says that, you know, you just look at carefully at the generator. Here there's a generator which is a fixed point, and there's a generator which is a fixed point here. And it goes to the same generator as a fixed point of phi squared plus something else that, that you, you can sort of neglect to first order. Okay? And it involves, it's interesting, the interesting classical sort of Hamiltonian dynamics questions. But the proof that we should actually have is this thing here. So these flow cohomology groups come with all sorts of operations which are determined by surfaces. So in, you know, in formalism, very Oxford thing, you can say they form a topological quantum field theory. Okay? So for instance, if you have two automorphisms, there's a, a product like this, and that's, that depends on this, on this kind of you know, 
you draw this as a pair of pants. And in fact, the pair of pants then enters when you try to define it. You can take phi equals to psi, and it you will get a product structure that goes from phi tensor phi to phi squared, which is already close to what I was talking about. Now, this topological quantum field theory also works in a version where your surfaces allow symmetries. So in particular, you can look at this thing here, it's called the pair of pants, with a Z2 action, which rotates this thing here. I don't know if you see the Z2 action. It acts on this right end here, which is where phi square sits, by half rotation, and it acts on the left by exchanging the two ends. Okay. And so what you get is actually, you get this equivariant product here that I defined. So it goes, here it acts by half rotation of loops, and here it acts by exchanging the two factors. And so how should we actually prove that this is an isomorphism? Well, we should prove that this is an isomorphism by defining a map in opposite direction, which goes by looking at the same surface, but now this is my input for the operation, this is the output. So that gives you a, a sort of dual co-product. So you put the two together, and they look like this. So one of the axioms says that you can compose by gluing together surfaces. And this doesn't, you know, if I'm, I'm trying to prove that this guy here is an isomorphism, right, by exhibiting this thing here as its inverse, maybe, but this guy, so if this is the inverse, this guy here um, should be the identity, right? But it isn't really, it doesn't really look like the identity at all. The identity is induced by just having two cylinders. Okay. Now, the reason why it's called topological quantum field theory is because the conformal structure you have on these surfaces, the a priori Riemann surfaces, is actually irrelevant. And that includes, so I can make, um, you know, make any part of this Riemann surface thinner, um, so I could, and in particular I can take this circle here that goes, the waist that goes around, so not the one that I drew, but the other one, and I can shrink it to a point. And then it becomes, uh, you know, then it looks almost like the identity map, there's like two cylinders, just they're tied together at this tip point here. And we know what it means it's tied together, it's some kind of operation that involves the equivalent cohomology class of the diagonal. So the invertibility of the, di of, the, of the diagonal class, which was the thing that came up in classical localization, should tell you that, that this is, uh, you know, this is actually not an isomorphism, these are not inverses, but, but their product is the identity. And the same thing happens in the other order, where you glue them together here, you get a genus one surface, and you're supposed to take this circle here and shrink it to a point in which case you get an annulus with two points identified with each other, okay? So it basically what I'm trying to say is that this formalism of topological quantum field theory actually implies this thing as, as a sort of elementary consequence. H however, that's not actually the proof that I gave uh, for reasons that I am too chicken, you know. Uh, topological, this topological quantum field theory structure is very simple to describe, and then when you wrote, want to write down the details, it, it seems to always take, uh, you know, 50 pages to do anything. Okay, so this is as far as I get. So I haven't really gotten back to concrete applications about two periodic points because they're a little elusive. But there is a lot of information about this, how phi and phi square behave and how you distinguish the, the fixed points of phi square that come from those of pi, by the, uh, of, of phi, from those that are actually exchanged. Um, now in, in the last two minutes, for the very last time, I'm going to make a cut and go somewhere completely different. Okay. which is the following thing, that there's a problem in homological algebra, or in fact, don't commute to geometry, but a purely algebraic problem, where I think you can use the input, the experience that we had here for periodic points, to actually solve it. But I haven't done it yet. Uh, this is the problem. Okay? And the analogy is kind of well known, but I'm not going to explain it because it's kind of complicated. So where before that we had a manifold, we now have an associative algebra over K, or actually, to make it slightly more interesting, a differential graded algebra. So sometimes, these are sometimes called a non-commutative space. And, you know, just like here I have a manifold, I want to assume it's smooth and compact, there are some, some kind of counterparts of this. But this is an object of really non-commutative algebraic geometry. And the analog of, you know, an automorphism of the manifold, well, it would be an automorphism of the algebra, really, but the, most algebras don't have really very many interesting automorphisms. There's a slight generalization where you consider a bimodule. And then, so these bimodules form, um, you know, at least a semigroup, and so you can square this guy, there's, that corresponds to taking the tensor square, and there's an analog of Fleur cohomology, which is a purely algebraic gadget. It's called the Hochschild homology with coefficients in this P here, okay? And so, so this works well formally. For instance, you know, the Fleur cohomology of phi square should carry an involution, which is half loop rotation. 
well, it does carry. And so, and in fact, the Hochschul homology of this thing here also have, has an evolution, which is kind of looks exactly like half rotation of the circle once you've write it down. And so the analog of the um, Smith inequality is, um, it would be an inequality of ranks like this. So this is a pure problem of homological algebra. In fact, um, it's a toy version of uh, the problem, the, the sort of most sort of fundamental problem of, of this ver type of non-commutative geometry, which is the problem of degeneration of the hodge de Ram spectral sequence. So there's an attempt made on this by Troyman and Lipschitz, which consider, you know, they consider this, take this guy here, take it, uh, so this car has a Z2 action, so we can do the Tate cohomology. And if, if, if we are right, as before, that should just be, this Tate thing should just be the ordinary Hochschild homology. And they couldn't prove it. They proved that to first approximation it's true. So there's a spectral seek, you can sort of ignore part of the differential here. Then you get this. And then there are a priori higher order terms which would make this smaller than that. But if we could prove that these higher order terms don't exist, then this would actually prove this conjecture. Okay? And now you will notice that you know, what's really missing in here, so there is some kind of filtration argument, which roughly speaking, you can think of an analog of the filtration by action functionals, um, but there's no actual map, right? So I think the, 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 the approach to this should clearly be to construct an analog of the equivalent product. Okay? And in fact, this is in some sense, this thing is already, so you have to sort of construct the map from here to there um, using sort of equivariant product, sorry, from, yeah, from he here to there as equivariant product, and then you would apply filtration argument to show that it's an isomorphism. Or you can do the inverse map if you like better. Um, in principle, this product map is actually contained in the work um, of Hopkins and Lurie, just it's so abstract that I can't figure out how it would interact with the filtration. But it's, it seems like a doable thing, and uh, this leads to all sorts of you know, additional structure, analogs of you know, Steenroth squares and Stiefel Whitney classes in Hochschild homology. So we can export our knowledge and uh, have a lot of fun in uh, homological algebra, which I'm sure you wouldn't have told at the beginning of the talk. <laughs>